Hey everyone, uh, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to talk about the SSRF, uh, which is a server side request forgery. Uh, don't get it confused with the CSRF, uh, uh, that's a bit different, and we have covered that in the past previous video. If you are confused, uh, please check it out. Uh, the server side request forgery is is a bit dangerous stack uh, given that uh, if one is able to exploit one can easily bypass uh, uh, like you know the access control the firewall rules been set up uh, on the application uh, for the front end uh, so without further ado uh, what we're going to cover uh, the agenda we have for this uh, episode is going through what this SRF is We'll talk about the couple exploit scenarios. Uh, we'll also uh, check how you can bypass certain basic validations. And then uh, for the developers, what would be the mitigation? All right, so let's dive deep into it. So what is the SSRF? Uh, so it's a web security uh, vulnerability uh, that allows an attacker to induce the server-side applications uh, to make the HTTP request to an arbitrary domain of the attacker's choosing. Now let's take a look at the uh, in the diagram, like how it works. So suppose there is an attacker, or let's say there is, this is an user who is interacting with the application. Let's say there is a, a Gmail or Facebook or any any XYZ application. And of course, uh, uh, when you are accessing or when you are interacting with the application, there, is, there are much more components in the back end. Uh, for example, you have a database. Uh, you could have like a elastic search. So there might be a few other components as well which are hidden from the attacker or from the user who is accessing through front end. But that's only be accessible by the application component. So here what's going to happen is the attacker would put a certain uh, like you know malicious payload like this which will get to the application and then if the application has let's say no validation or a poor validation it can then get access or access this particular URL which is localhost MySQL or localhost Elasticsearch if it's a remote host then probably the IP address and the MySQL and then give the data back to the attacker. So the main difference here uh, if you compare with the CSRF is in the CSRF we were tricking browser on assuming that the request it's coming from is the authenticated user. Here we are actually tricking this application component and getting whatever access that the attacker needs through the web application. Now let's take a look at the, some scenarios and, and probably that will get even more clear. So, assume this is the code you have. Uh, of course in the real application the code which will be much more complex. Uh, but let's say it's accepting the URL uh, from the get, uh, get request or the URL string and then uh, it opens up that URL uh, without any validation. So how can attacker exploit it? So a uh, first scenario is uh, the exploitation could happen against the server itself. So for example, this is the attacker or the user, and let's suppose there are no backend module, there's a simple application, just two tier, and here you have the application, and on the same application, you have some admin modules, you have control panel, you have database, everything is in one system. Now, what attacker can do here is, of course, it can go and say, oh, I want to access HTTP localhost admin, right? And the application will say, uh, no, that's, that's access denied. Like, we cannot let you access this because this is purely restricted to be accessed by this system. So attacker cannot directly access this. However, if it uh, put this payload as one of the requests, uh, like you know, URL or, or whatever they have to do, they, let's say the application expects like you know, URL, and then it encodes this URL and sends it to the application. It does not perform any validation, and what it will do is it will let attacker connect to this admin module. So that's one attack scenario. The other one is, let's say there is also other protocols uh, uh, running on this uh, or support supported on this system. Uh, you do the Nmap scan or, or like you know some other way you discover that there is FTP or file protocol open. What you do is the attacker would try to access that those things through the file etc password. Now why would a web application or this system would allow attacker to access this? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. One, when the access to the admin module comes, 
the request originator would not be the attacker, but actually it's a web application. And that's a trusted entity uh, in the architecture because this is an internal domain. So most of the time, uh, the developers wouldn't check the authentication or authorization of this component because they assume if the request is coming from here, that must be an authorized user. Other scenario, uh, due to some disaster recovery uh, uh, scenarios, so for example, you need someone uh, to be able to SSH onto this host and able to access this admin module in terms of you need to back up something, you need to restore something, or you need to change the credentials or whatever. Or the uh, admin itself forgot about the credentials. So then this is a good way to allow them to uh, do those sort of uh, things. So someone can SSH into this system and, and do this. Uh, the other uh, scenario is uh, let's say uh, because this is like you know an internal entity and this is like you know within our trust boundary and there is no way uh, attacker can have access to this admin module it will they will not implement any protection developers will just feel like oh yeah this is within our trust boundary so we don't need to protect this resource which is completely wrong so this is the one way uh, which uh, the exploitation works or attacker could exploit the other scenario is the exploit the other backend system. So, for example, as we talked about, we have some MySQL or Elasticsearch in the backend. Now, what attacker can do is it will forward the same unvalidated or same malicious URL to this system or the web application, and which will uh, indeed call the this IP address and where the admin module is, or maybe it will, like you know, instead of admin, it will say uh, MySQL or whatever. So that's again possible. It's the same same thing, but rather instead of localhost, now we are trying to exploit the other internal host, which is not externally visible, right? So this is the internal IP address. Now let's say how do we bypass some of the defenses? Uh, so uh, of course one defense that each develop everyone would think, oh, let's just make sure, like you know, we are not accepting request uh, or the any any URL string where we have 127.0.0.1 or the local host. Now to bypass that, what you can do is you can actually encode and use this string or the numbers, right? Uh, and if the validation is poor, it, uh, you can easily bypass this. The other thing you can do is you can register your own domain. So for example, let's say uh, www.example.com and then you resolve and make sure it resolves to the 127.0.0.1. So when the actually application system uh, will uh, route the request, it will actually route to the 127.0.0.1 because that's the DNS mapping we have. Of course, you can use the URL coding, our old friend, which we have been using for injection, access, all sort of attacks, and case variation. If you are not sure uh, what these techniques are, uh, definitely head over to our access exploitation uh, playlist, where we discuss how, where we have discussed a bunch of techniques. Uh, the other uh, approach that the developers could take is the whitelist based input filter. So sometimes they would only whitelist certain uh, URLs or IP address or whatever. So here what you can do is you can make a use of the at the rate character and then put, you put your uh, evil host or domain uh, which you have created. You can also do something like uh, uh, hash and then you put your domain uh, before that or you can standard use like a DNS uh, uh, supplied like you know DNS rule set where you follow the same rule set expected host dot your host so you can use this uh, bunch of techniques and you can also URI encode the characters and then send it so you can use bunch of these techniques and, and try to bypass recently I've seen many many applications being exploited uh, due to C uh, SSRF on missing the uh, missing the validation so the validation is not input validation is not just for access or SQL injection which also could uh, uh, could cause like SSRF. Actually, this should be a SSRF, not the CSRF. Uh, anyway, uh, so let's talk about the mitigation. Uh, the mitigation here we have the first off is the whitelist and the DNS resolution. So as I said, like you do not 
trust, uh, you do not follow the blacklist. You rather follow the whitelist. You only allow the requests to be incurred from a specific uh, IP addresses or the DNS name, right? If a whitelist approach does not suit you, then probably you can use the blacklist, but you have to be very careful with that. The other uh, uh, approach or uh, the mitigation you uh, you should implement is the response handling. So uh, in earlier diagram, we saw here that if the attacker is able to exploit one of the backend system or this system, it will give the response back to the attacker. Now, if we have some way to validate whether the response is actually expected or not, before we send it back to the attacker, we can partially block the attack. So uh, best thing you can do is probably you can configure some unit tests or integration tests, uh, positive and negative, to make sure uh, every time you're making changes, like you know you follow this standard and you're not leaking some sensitive information back to the attacker, which it does not belong to him. Uh, third one, uh, disable unused URL schemas. Uh, of course, if only HTTPS requires, then you should not enable FTP uh, or file or DTTP or DTCP or even HTTP, right? So you should block those or disable those schemas if it's not required. And the last thing is authentication on the internal services. So if, uh, as I said, even if uh, all the system components are within your trust boundaries, you should still make sure each request from the internal resources are authenticated and authorized before it can make the request and, and follow the least privilege model. So if the application component only requires read-only access, then only give read-only access. So this uh, this is pretty much covers everything what I want to discuss and show you how the SSRF actually works because a lot of people are confused between the CSRF and the SSRF. Uh, thank you for your time. I uh, like you know, of course, try it out whenever you can. And if you enjoy this video, please hit the like button, and subscribe to the Cyber Security TV. Um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, comment uh, comment down. And if not, then I'll see you all next Monday with another interesting topic. Until then, bye.